Blessed be your name in the land that is plentiful, where your streams of abundance flow. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name when I'm found in the desert place, though I walk through the wilderness. Blessed be your name. Every blessing you pour out. Blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your glorious name. Blessed be your name when the sun's shining down on me, when the world's all as it should be, blessed be your name. Blessed be your name on the road marked with suffering. Though there's pain in the offering, blessed be your name. Every blessing you pour out, I'll turn back to praise. When the darkness closes in, Lord, Blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your name, blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your glorious name. You give and take away, you give and take away. Lord, blessed be your name. You give and take away. You give and take away. My heart will choose to say, Lord, blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your glorious
see some faces, give a little bit away, but can't go hug. But I'm just excited because I see some new faces coming back to the church. Amen. And when you get done waving, sit on down. Thank you, Rachel. Come on, I was getting nervous there, you know, people weren't showing up. You know, you got to be, you got to have to watch out because I was just talking with Mark before service. I'm saying, you know, I wonder if sometimes we shouldn't start, start, start the service at 1030. We couldn't do then, 1030, huh? It might be good, I don't know. Hey, so we have one bit of business we need to do right now before we get to the message. So after service, we're going to, you see the tent outside, we're going to have pizza outside. We're going to, we're going to physically distance, we're going to wear our masks. Except when you're eating pizza, clearly, okay? Yeah, that might get a little bit, we, we're fortunate to have some nurses here, so if you're choking on your mask, maybe they can save you. But uh, what I'd like to do is just, we need to take a quick count. If you are gonna be staying for pizza, this isn't like, because some people need to go place. Could you just raise your hand so we get a count? Can you get a count? Mark's still counting, keep them up, Mark's still counting. I'm just pretend. Mark's the brains behind this operation. Okay. Uh, what? Oh, uh, the three more coming there, Mark. So, and one more here. And one more there. Look at this. These people still coming. I like this, huh? So maybe we need to get a couple more, Mark, huh? That's good. No problem. Don't worry. The pizza that we ordered, I like every flavor I already ordered. I hope you do. <laughs> but uh, it's good to be here. Hey, and I do want one thing. You know, it's fun. It's good to come to service. But there is one word, that I, I, one word of prayer I'd like to do. I just got an uh, email from uh, Dita. Her dad, uh, back home, he just fell. He fell off the ladder. He's hurt. And so I want to uplift him in prayer in that, you know, it's very hard when you're separated from your family, right? 
because someone gets hurt, you can't get there. I mean, just think, our sister Joanna, she just lost her mom back in the Philippines, and she couldn't get home. This really hurts a person on the inside. This is, this is hard for our, our, both of our sisters here, so I just, I just want to uplift her, her, uh, Dita and her family in prayer. Lord, I do thank you for this day, Father. I thank you we get to come to worship you today, Lord. I uplift Dita's family and uh, her dad for his help, and Dita, that she will have peace, Lord. The prayer is that she'll have peace because the outcome is up to you, Lord. And how we come and react to the outcome is so important. Give Dita and her family peace about this, and I do so hope that her dad is, is healthy and well and recovered quickly. We thank you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. So it's good to be here. It's good to see you. Good to see all of you. And today we're going to be in Ephesians chapter 4, and the message is titled, Are We Unified? Are we unified? It's an interesting, interesting uh, title, I thought. Today we're going to be looking at the unity of faith. Unity is agreement, right? When you have unity, you have agreement. Faith is a conviction of a belief. A belief with the predominant idea of trust. When you have faith in something, you're trusting in it. We look at our slide here for a definition of faith. Hebrews uh, in Hebrews it says, now faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. That's interesting, isn't it? I've never seen Jesus Christ, but I have faith and I trust in him. I trust in him and everything I've learned about Jesus Christ is through his word. We're going to be talking about the word a lot today. That's where it all comes from. But faith, it, it, it's crazy in a manner of speaking. It takes a lot of faith to have faith. Think about it. It takes a lot of faith to have faith. Have you ever seen, and I think I've said this before, one of those faith and training uh, exercises people do, businesses do it and, and stuff. What I mean by this is you go like, to some, some place for an exercise for a day or so with your business, and one of the exercises they do is you stand up like on a table or up on a platform with your arms crossed, right? And you fall back, and behind you is your teammates. And they're all sitting there, six of them, with their arms all interlocked. And you need to have faith and trust that they're going to catch you. It's kind of wild, isn't it? So I watched a couple of YouTube videos on this. There's people that didn't catch them. How can you not do that? There's six of you. You have one job. The person right through, boom, several of them. It was, it was wild, but it's an exercise they do. And years ago, we went on a, a missions trip to Mexico to visit our missionaries, the Browns. They're in the desert. They're, they're, they have this place in, in El Solcillo. You can look it up, you know, Google it, not now. And it's out in the middle of the desert. They own this huge tract of land. It's a desert. Land is cheap, okay? But they have a high ropes course in it. In the middle of, this is a desert, folks. Soweto cactuses, everything. And what it is designed for, it's really high. <laughs> it's designed to teach you about faith and trust. Because you're harnessed up. It was built by mountain climbers. You've got a helmet on. And then you go up. On a tight rope, you fall off. You go on rings, you fall off. The thing catches you every single time, right? You gotta have faith and trust. You get to the end of it. You're on this little tiny platform, and out in front of you is a trapeze bar. You wanna get down, you have to jump for it. There ain't no way you can hit this sucker. And you gotta have faith that thing's gonna catch you in there. I didn't do it. I said to him, listen, I grew up a son of a landscape gardener. I've been up in more trees with no harnesses growing up. I figure, I'm done with it, okay? I wasn't going to do it, but it, it was interesting to see this thing. You know, the unity of faith that Paul is revealing to the church here in Ephesus. That's what he's doing. That's his job. Remembering this, I say it every week, this church was composed of two different people groups, the Jews and the Gentiles. These were separate people. Paul's got them together. It's wild. As people, we have an interesting way of separating ourselves. We can find more ways to divide ourselves than we can. We can divide ourselves ge geographically, by race, by education, by our socioeconomic status. We can find more ways to divide ourselves. It's amazing how we can do this. The only separation I think that we need to really worry about is regarding our soul. Do you recall a couple of weeks ago? I, don't, I never remember how long ago was I spoke on something, but the rich man uh, down in, in Hades and Lazarus in, in the bosom of Abraham, there was a separation between their souls. 
It was a gulf, and you could not cross it. That's the separation that we need to be concerned about, not all these other things that we make up. Because I'm better than you because I am, and you are. It just amazes me. But we do this as people. I recently, uh, I recently watched this. Uh, I don't know if you ever watch any of the videos by uh, Living Waters. Uh, we actually taught Living Waters, Ray Comfort's uh, evangelistic program here on Thursday nights before. And uh, it's great. It is. But I was watching Ray Comfort do this. Ray Comfort's interesting because he was a Jew that became a Christian. So he fit in Ephesus just perfectly, right? There he is. He's a Jew that became a Christian. So he was in the church in Ephesus, in a manner of speaking. But he was witnessing to this couple, and he, was, he uses, the guy is just good. He uses race and skin color as a focal point, as a tool. He's using this to get to Christ. He's using this to get to the forgiveness of sin, is what Ray Comfort did. And his challenge to him, when it, he eventually gives a full dialogue about being saved. But what he says to them, I thought it was interesting. He said to them, wouldn't you say that racism is a matter of sin rather than skin? And I went, oh, wow, isn't that true? It doesn't always come back to sin. I mean, we get caught up in it, but because it, it comes in so many ways. I said, wow, that, that caught me off guard. It caught the couple he was speaking to way off guard. You saw them, they were a little tense. All of a sudden, they smiled and go, yeah. It was interesting, that body language that emanated from them. But he's, there he is dealing with two different people groups. And here in Ephesus, he's dealing with the two different people groups, the Jews and the Gentiles. You know what's sort of like, I was trying to imagine this. It's like inviting two different families over to your house for dinner. One family is vegan. The other family are burger lovers. And you're going to have them over to dinner. Uh-huh. Right? This is, think about this meal. You sit it down at the table. It's going to be awkward. And everyone's going to be a little bit, I would say, over polite. Right? Because we don't want to hurt anyone's feelings. But you know what? I like burgers. And you, know, and you can see this whole dialogue happening, going through this. Be the, it's, a, it's strange happenstance that would be there. And there's never going to be agreement on dietary habits, right? I don't think McDonald's has an abundant business in India selling Big Macs. They just don't because they think cows are sacred. It's just not that important to them. And we want unity in our families. Oh, don't we want unity in our families? Isn't it good? Mom and dad got to put on a good front. They want the children to be together. It's interesting sometimes, and you may have seen this, but two siblings grow up, for example, and they're tight. Right? They're there. Then all of a sudden, she marries a guy, and he doesn't like her. The brother doesn't like it. And he's looking at his sister saying, you're going to marry him? Because guys know guys. Ladies, just so you know, guys know guys. We know guys that are dogs. We'll just, we just do. I'm just telling you. And uh, you're looking at this. You're going to marry him, sis? Are you crazy? And she marries him. So now every time you get together, your brother-in-law, right? And your heart is an outlaw. You don't want to have anything to do with him. So that there's disunity now in this family, in that close relationship that they have. In the church, for believers, we're a family too. What does our family unity look like? Superficially, it's easy to say. Well, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, you'll be saved. We're all Christians. We're all good, right? I say wrong. I say that's not good enough. Because if that was true, why isn't there unity among everyone that claims to be a Christian? How can people that allege to be of the family of God be so divided or be so ineffective in their walk of faith that they're going through at times? You know, so in previous weeks, we've looked at some of the physicians that were in the Bible. And we looked in, in, in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 11. And, and what it said there, uh, in Christ giving out the gifts, he says, he himself gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, some to be pastor teachers. These, these positions, basically four positions here. They all have some fundamental similarities to them. They reveal God. They reveal God through the word of God, all four of those positions. So the term apostle, basic definition for the apostle is someone who was sent on a mission, right? And it says uh, in Ephesians uh, 2.20, it tells us, that having built the foundation of, 
having been built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Jesus Christ being the chief cornerstone, in whom the whole body, being fitted together, grows into the holy temple of the Lord. This is referring to the church, because the apostles' job was they, they were part of the process of building the church. That's what they were doing. That's what they were doing. They were building the church. They weren't bricklayers. They were revealing the word of God. And the prophets, they were part of this process too, building the church, going through and doing it. You know, and prophets, they were interesting. Uh, the prophets all happened before the apostles, right? They're sort of completely separated. Because the apostles' job was to equip people for service as well. They really were. Prophets uh, in history have not been really well liked. <laughs> prophets have been kind of hated. They, why? Because they tell you the truth. If you're not ready to receive, receive the truth, you usually don't like the person giving it to you, do you? If your heart's not right, it's like, get out of my face. Well, the prophets had a job to do. And Isaiah was one of these prophets. And it says this, that, that this is a rebellious people, lying children, who will not hear the law of the Lord. So that's describing Israel, right? That's who they are. They're lying children. But what's the response of Israel? Who say to the seer, do not see? And to the prophets, do not prophesy to the right things. Speak to us smooth things. Prophesy deceits. Isn't that an amazing statement? Don't tell me the truth. Tell me what I want to hear. That's all I care about. I don't really want to hear your opinion on things. It's, it's amazing. And the job of the evangelist, what did the evangelist do? The evangelist brings the good news to those who have not believed yet. Again, they're bringing the word. All these offices we're talking about, they bring the word of God to the people. They're not performers. They're not a sideshow. They're bringing the word of God. And the last position was the pastor. The pastor is a shepherd, an overseer, an elder. That's what a pastor does. They care for the flock. The pastor cares for the sheep. That is what the word of God says and protects the sheep. Now, sheep eat grass. That's a good thing, right? They like green pastures. What do we eat? We need to eat the word of God. The word of God is what needs to fill us. What do sheep need the pastor to do? To protect them from wolves, right? They, they need the shepherd to protect them from wolves. What does the flock here need to do? The pastor needs to protect us from wolves. Can a pastor be with everyone all the time? No. <coughs> Which is why it's incumbent on the pastor to teach the word of God so that we know the word of God and we can know when there's a wolf present, when someone's trying to create division in the body. It's so important. These positions were created by God to equip the saints for the ministry, for ministry, for service, and edifying the body. So now we get to our text. That was a long intro, huh? It's okay. I enjoyed it. I did. I loved it. All this unity is so important. Now we come to Ephesians. Are we unified? That's really what we're getting down to. Are we unified? We're going to touch on verse 12 from last week just to have it in line. For the equipping of the saints for the work of ministry for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come to the unity of faith and that the knowledge of the Son of God and the knowledge of the Son of God to the perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Let's pray. Lord, I do thank you for this morning to be here. I thank you that I have the opportunity to present your word, Lord. I do hope that my brothers and sisters will learn from this, Lord, that we'll learn that your word is so precious and is the only thing that's going to bring us unity of faith. We thank and we praise you, Jesus. Amen. The unity of faith. So there is a goal for everything we're doing. There is an end game for everything that we're doing. Unity has a certain look to it, though. Unity has a look to it. And we see that look in, in, in Romans 15.5. Because in Romans 15.5, it says, Now may the God of patience and comfort grant you to be like-minded towards one another, according to Christ Jesus, that you, may be, that you may with one mind and one mouth glorify God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Unity is being perfected, completed, is, is being perfected and completed in Christ, not in ourselves. There's many verses that I could have put up here about being unity. This is just one I just chose because I can reach into a jar. There's so many about them. But what keeps us from the unity of faith? 
What keeps us from the unity of faith is not being in the word of God. That's what does it. That's what it says in verse 13 of our text. It says, till we all come to the unity of faith and the knowledge of the Son of God, to the perfect man, to the measure and the stature of Christ. Till we all come or until we attain. We all, it says there, till we all get this. That means all of us, all of us together. Christians are not in isolation. We're not to be by ourselves when we're coming and learning about the word of God. That's not how, it's, that's not how it, it works. That's why he, even here at Calvary, we have something called the discipleship class. Discipleship, where we disciple each other in the word of God. The reason we do that is because we're copying exactly what Jesus did. That's all. We're, we're plagiarizing Jesus' process, and it's a good process to plagiarize. Learning the word of God from one another. It's very important. But also, we all indicates that there are, there are no elite Christians. There's no elite Christians. It doesn't exist. Paul was not an elite believer. On the contrary, Paul was an elite Christian killer. He was like James Bond 007. Paul was given a license to kill by the Sanhedrin. Did you ever think about that? He was an elite killer. It wasn't until Christ came into his life that his was changed. Till we all come is a destination. The place where the, there's the unity of faith, the full knowledge of Christ, ultimately mature in the faith. In summary, what this verse is saying, that we will come to spiritual maturity through the knowledge of the Son of God, which is the unity of faith. That's what this verse is boiling it down to. But there's obstacles. There are obstacles. Don't you hate obstacles sometimes? So maybe Kate will run an obstacle course, but I don't want to really live my life like one. And all these obstacles and these roadblocks, they're not all external. You know now when you're driving around, it's the summer in New England, there's construction everywhere, right? There's orange cones everywhere, it seems. There's always an obstacle to get around. Okay, they're everywhere. But the obstacles to the unity of faith are internal. They're not external. They're the obstacles, if you recall, that the rich young ruler had that came to Jesus. I love this, the, the account of the rich young ruler. And we all have favorite things in the Bible, I hope. I hope you have favorite texts text in the Bible that you like to go to. The reason I hope that, it means if you have those, that you're in the Word of God. If you don't have any go-to texts and verses, it means you might not be in the Word of God. And we're saying the unity of faith is the Word of God. But the rich young ruler, he went to Jesus, asked him how to have eternal life, right? He goes to him, good master, he says to him. It's always so interesting, good master. Jesus says to him, who are you calling good? You calling me good? He just tests him right in the beginning. He really does. But he explains to Jesus all of his accomplishments, his great dedication to the law. But for the unity of faith to be achieved, one must be equipped for ministry, is what our text has told us. That's when Ephesians 12 it said, for the equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body. If a ministry is service, we need to be equipped for that. What is ministry? Ministry is serving others. Jesus explained to the rich young ruler what he needed to do, what he needed to do in, in Matthew 19. He tells the rich young ruler, and the rich young ruler, and when you think about it, what he's saying is, follow you how? This is what the, what's going to be in the rich young ruler's mind after Jesus gets done with him. He says, if you want to be perfect, go, sell what you have, give to the poor, and you will have treasures in heaven. Come follow me. That's how you want me to follow you? You want me to give up everything? All of my riches? It didn't sit well with him. It did not at all. You want to be perfect and mature? Do this. You need to love one another. And once again, recall the, once again, that rich man that was in Sheol while Lazarus was in Abraham's bosom, right? He had full consciousness. It was too late for him, though. He knew that Lazarus was that poor man at his door that he should have cared for. And it's not just the act of caring that I'm talking about for the poor, but it's a heartfelt action that knows you need to care for that person. It comes from your heart, not just your wallet. Okay? And poor might come in many different aspects. He didn't get it. There was, there, there was, there was nothing there for him to do. Unity of faith is being doctrinally sound. 
doctrine is instruction, especially as it applies to a lifestyle application. Instruction of the Word of God. That's what the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, and pastors are doing, bringing the Word of God. See, the rich young ruler had a, a, a list of do's and don'ts. He sort of had a checklist, didn't he? You know, I love checklists. I've used them in private industry for years. We have checklists here at Calvary. We do. We do. If, you wanna, if you're on a cleaning crew, if you're on a cleaning crew, I want to thank you for being on a cleaning crew because I love you. You're on a cleaning crew. And the cleaning crew knows we have a checklist for the cleaning, cleaning the facility. There's a weekly and a monthly and all these different things that we do. Why do we have the checklist? So you know what to do when you show up. <laughs> and uh, you can be focused when you come to do it. But it's interesting. If you're doing the checklist, right, and you, you have a checklist, you're going down it, OK? What if something's not on the checklist? Suppose you go downstairs, and there's a great big coffee stain on the floor. Pete spilt his coffee during the week, and it dried. It's nasty, right? Do you walk by and say, oh, nope, this isn't the week to mop the floor. Nope, I don't clean that. I don't think so. You're going to clean it, right? And always the Good Samaritan. Do you remember the Good Samaritan? I don't think he had a checklist. Now, the priests and the Levites, they had checklists, right? They knew what they were supposed to do by a checklist. But on their checklist, when the man was laying in the gutter, beaten and dying, when he was in that position, compassion and mercy was not on the priests and the Levites' checklist. So they walked right by him. But the Good Samaritan, he said, no, this guy needs help. I'm going to help him. I'm going to minister to him. We need to learn this, folks, about ministry. Ministry is not always convenient. Ministry is not always fun. But ministry is love and action. That's what ministry is. See, the rich young ruler's faith, it was in the here and now, in himself. He didn't really understand what the prophets had been teaching him, equipping him about. The prophets were equipping people. They were all along. They were trying to set God's people right, weren't they? God's people didn't always lie, like it. They said, no, don't tell us those things. Tell us deceits. In the book of Jeremiah, uh, it's interesting. God has some good things to say about Jeremiah. It's interesting as, as I was going through this. In, in Jeremiah 22, it says, this is King Jos uh, in, in Jeremiah, this is King Josiah that is being said about. He says, and he judged the cause of the poor and the needy then it was well. Was not this knowing me, says the Lord. Isn't that a great thing to have said about you? You actually know me. You know me. This is God saying that King Josiah knew him. Do we know him? Do we know him? King Josiah got it. The rich young ruler, not so much. His real knowledge of, the, of God is very lacking. And Moses gave instructions too. Moses gave instructions regarding uh, the poor, okay? Because the poor were poor, and they would become servitude to rich, rich people in Israel. And they would be in Israel, in their servitude for seven years, and then they were set free. And God gave very specific instructions on how we to treat them. And in Deuteronomy it says, you shall surely give to him. That means the rich man is now going to give to the poor man. And your heart should not be grieved when you give to him. Because for all this, the Lord your God will bless you in all your works and in all which he has put in your hand. So when the poor person was in the service of the rich person, at the end of seven years, they were released from service. Not only were they released from service, but the rich person was supposed to help them, edify them, and give them what they needed to so they would be successful. Read through Deuteronomy 15. It's a wonderful example of how the rich people would help the poor people. going through this. The rich young ruler could have learned from the Old Testament. The rich young ruler could have learned from Jesus, but he did not. This, is, this was doctrine and how to live life and have the unity of faith, instruction from the Word of God. Choosing parts of the Word of God we like and ignoring others cannot bring unity. That's a patchwork of faith. In reality, it's not faith at all. That's faith. You cannot pick and choose what you want out of the Word of God. What's faith? Faith is the act of believing. Faith 
is what is believed in. The rich young ruler had neither of those two things. He had neither of those. The faith in the text we're reading about is not the act of belief. It is not. Remember, Paul is writing this letter to the church in Ephesus. He was writing to believers. So he's concerned about what they believe in, the truth, the doctrines that they had. When Christians are properly taught, equipped, or set right, they do the work of service and ministry. The body will be built up and become spiritually mature. This is what Paul's trying to get across. Wasn't that the issue in the Corinthian church? Do you remember the Corinthian church? There was a lot of disunity in the Corinthian church. They, were, uh, they had doctrinal ignorance, spiritual immaturity. That church was a mess. People on the outside of the church were looking inside of the church and they're saying, really? You're a church? They had sexual immorality. They, they had everything in there. And Paul's left to deal with them. And what Paul says to them, the resolution to the disunity, he says to them, now I plead with you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, <laughs> that you all speak the same thing, that be no divisions among you, that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. Paul was trying to bring these people back together. They were so divided. He was pointing them to Jesus, the Son of God, and that the unity would be, they'd have unity of what is spoken, they'd have unity of what is thought, and they have unity in their judgments. This is the unity of faith. The Corinthians, and us here at Calvary Baptist Church, we need to trust in the re revealed word of God as our source of unity. Not picking and choosing what we will and will not use from the Bible. See, that's what you do at Thanksgiving when you get a turkey. I want this, I want that. You pick and choose what you want. The word of God is not a turkey. It's something that we really need to cherish. We need to obtain knowledge, and it requires work. The knowledge of the Son of God. The knowledge of the Son of God, as well, is in verse 13 of our text. It says, still we all come to the unity of faith, to the knowledge of the Son of God. Knowledge of the Son of God requires us to know him. We just said earlier, King Josiah, he's dealing with the poor, was commended, and God said that he knew me. You know, we can know all about Jesus academically, and people do. People are really smart. They get their PhD, they get their Masters of Divinity, do all these things, and that's great. And I think it's wonderful to get more education to do these things. But when you do that, do you know him? Do you know him? Is he in your heart? Or are you caught up in the academia? What about Jesus' sheep? My sheep hear my voice, and I know them and they follow me. You know, sheep seek unity in a flock. We're a flock. We need to seek unity. What do we do? We come together in a flock. We're spread out during the week, but we're coming together. We're sort of like a flock coming together, aren't we? So yeah, we want to be together. And we're going to go in a flock. One sheep will lead the other sheep to go someplace. But the sheep need to know and trust the shepherd. If an unfamiliar person comes, to a flock of sheep and tries to gather them up, the sheep won't recognize him, they won't recognize his smell, and they won't recognize his voice. That man will scatter the sheep. That's not the shepherd. They know who the shepherd is. That's important. See, Jesus knows his sheep, and he knows them intimately. Jesus desires that his sheep know him. The shepherd's call is from his word. God's word is calling out to his sheep. Are we responding? Now, when we trusted Jesus Christ, and I say when we, I hope you have trusted in Jesus Christ. I hope you are not relying on your good works. You might be a super nice person, and I love that. That's, be a good person. But if you're relying on your good works to get you to heaven, it's not going to work. It's just not how it works. We need to rely on Jesus Christ, what he did, his finished work on the cross. And after that, all the good works are wonderful because they're done in Christ's name. 
They really are. Knowing Jesus, that he's the way, the truth, and the light, is just the beginning. That's just the beginning of our walk. The Son of God is a very, very powerful image. Do you recall Jesus when he, when he was under interrogation by the high priest in Matthew 26? Let's recount it for a moment. He's being interrogated by the high priest before he's going to be crucified, actually before he sends to Pilate and the whole process of crucifixion. But it says that the high priest arose and said to him, do you answer nothing? What is it these, what is it these men testify against you? But Jesus kept silent. And the high priest answered and said to him, I put you under oath by the living God. Tell us if you are the Christ, the Son of God. And he continues on, and Jesus said, it is as you said. Nevertheless, I say to you, hereafter you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of power, coming on the clouds in heaven. What an incredible exchange took place at this time. The high priest is invoking God to tell Jesus to answer the question. Think of this scenario. The one man on earth that has the right to go into the Holy of Holies one time per year, the high priest, is cross-examining Jesus, the rightful occupant of the Holy of Holies. Do you see the irony in that? That's amazing to me. That's amazing to me. Jesus, this is Jesus of the Holy of Holies. Why doesn't the high priest know? Why doesn't he know who the Son of God is? Like I said, there's people with PhDs and great knowledge about Jesus that do not know him. They don't know him. Don't you think the high priest had tremendous knowledge? You don't get to be the high priest by accident. The world today is just like the high priest. Ignorant or refusing to, not, to acknowledge Jesus and wanting to erase Jesus from the fabric of our society. That's what the world's doing. It was understood by the high priest and those religious leaders that to be the son of God was to be of God. That claim made Jesus of the same nature as God. And because of that, he was considered a blasphemer because he was going to be as God. The high priest, Jesus' response, wasn't Jesus' response so masterful, okay? It is as you said. Jesus didn't say that he was the son of God, did he? He said, no, it is as you said. I didn't say it, you said it. He brought him right into it, didn't he? The high priest was so self-focused, he was so upset, he could not even see his own admission that Jesus was the son of God. He didn't understand it. And remember this always. Jesus allowed himself to go through this. He was the lamb to go to slaughter. He silently went there. This was his mission. This was his plan to redeem us. That's what he was doing. He did not defend himself. And he had the high priest identify who he was which brings us to spiritual maturity. Verse 13 again. Till we all come to the unity of faith, to the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Perfect equals mature. That's where we're being driven towards, being mature. Now being perfect, being matured, we are still flawed. We're still flawed people. Sorry, I'm very flawed. It's the way it is. But a mature person understands their flaws because they are mature. Do you catch that? When you're mature, you know you're flawed. And when you know you're flawed, you know what you can do when you do something wrong? And honestly, you can go tell someone, I'm sorry. I'm sorry I offended you. You know what? That is maturity. A lot of people won't do that. When you can, you can humble yourself to a brother or sister, 
I'm sorry. That's shown spiritual maturity. Now, we all know that being humble and saying sorry is not a real, real big deal in the world, is it? You're always going to be strong. I'm right, you're wrong at any cost. That's what it is. But maturity. You know, we teach our children from a very young age a lot of things. We teach our children the ABCs. It's great. It's fun. We teach them how to eat properly at the table, you know, so they're not licking the table up. It happens. They need to get that food in them. We teach them to do well on their tests at school. Got to study hard, little one. Study. Read that book. This is a good thing. At times, we put pressure on them to study hard. You want to go to a good college, you better study hard. Pressure, pressure, pressure. As this is how the majority of the maturation process of a child is done in the United States. That is what we call bringing them to maturity. That's what's happening. Is that maturity? You know, all that maturation I just was talking about, it's very self-focused. It might provide an education for good societal interaction, but is that the ultimate goal that one should have for their child? Oh, they're going to do well in society. Really? Is that healthy? Is that all? Tell me, what makes a church unhealthy? What destroys a church? What renders God's people inadequate? What makes a church immature, thus ineffective? It's the lack of knowledge of the word of God and obedience to it. It is not the lack of programs and methods in the church that destroy our people. In Hosea chapter 4, verse 6, it talks about the lack of knowledge. It's a great verse. It's scary. My people are destroyed for the lack of knowledge because you have rejected knowledge. I also will reject you from being priests for me because you have forgotten the law of your God. I also will forget your children. Wow. Wow. Rejecting knowledge. Rejecting knowledge. This is focused at Israel. It applies to us. The word of God is complete for all of us. When the church fails, it's not because of weak programs. It's because of weak teaching. The first concern of leadership of the church should be for the filled seats and those ones that are going to be watching this. First concern of leadership is for the filled seats, not the empty ones. Can't do anything about it. I can't speak to an empty seat, but I can speak to you. That's where our concern needs to be. Why do we come here together? Why are we here? To edify one another, to build each other up. That is why we come to worship on Sunday morning. Now, I ask myself this question. You ask yourself this question. You've probably heard this question before. It's a good question. If the pilot about to fly the plane I am getting on had the same knowledge of flying as I do of the word of God, would I get on that plane? Think about that. That pilot. We implicitly, it's the pilot. He or she, I'm going to get on. I'm going to Costa Rica. It's cool. Really? Do they know what they're doing? So I ask myself, as I this, do I know what I'm doing? How much of the word of God is in there? The unity of faith is the oneness reached when the body of doctrinal truth, the faith, is lived out by the body. When will we get there? The text says, till we all come. That's not our concern, folks. Our concern is the journey that's leading to maturity that we are called to it. So as we walk through each and every day, I encourage you over and over, we need to be in the Word of God. Don't do it in isolation. There's plenty of people in this room. If you let me know, I'll hook you up with someone. You could be studying the Word of God, or I'll do it with you. But we need to be in the Word of God. If we want to have the unity of faith, if we want to be the church that we've been called out to do, if we want to do ministry the way that we've been, we've been called out to do, we need to be in the Word of God. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, I do thank you. I thank you for your word. It is so powerful. The Son of God, that statement, 
That name is so powerful. The Son of God is of God because it is God. Please help us, Father, as we, as we leave here today, that we remember this, that your word is the only thing that will unify us. It's not a program. It's not a method. It's not funny jokes. None of these things. Your word is what unifies the body of Christ. We thank you and praise you for this day, Lord. And, and Father, I do. I uplift my brothers and sisters. And if anyone here is confused in any way, Lord, I, I encourage them to reach out and speak with me, Lord. And we'll just talk about your word. We thank you and we praise you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. It was good. So more people showed up. I'm so glad. I'm so glad you're here. We have a few things that we need to take care of. Now, we, you know, afterwards, we're going to have some pizza out there. We've got the head count and everything. Uh, I think uh, Dimitri may have taken off to go get pizza for us. Good man in there. But this, uh, one, one thing that we want to do is, is that uh, you saw an email out there about the Trabulsis in Lebanon. So they, we've been supporting the tri Trabulsis for like a number of years. And they're over there ministering uh, right now during a time of great trial. I want to just explain one little bit of information to you about ministering over there. It's, it's different. These are Christians ministering you know, in, in a different part of the world, the Middle East and stuff. So it's a different dynamic than we have here. Now, years ago, uh, uh, Joe's, uh, Joe's, Joe's brother, uh, Joe's sister, uh, Nyla, and his brother-in-law, Nick, they had moved back to Lebanon for a while. And there was a catastrophe, catastrophe went on over there. Something happened bad. And Nick had come back. I forget all the interactions. So much happened. But the point being, we had a presentation done here. And it showed that Christian church with tables all laid out, giving food to all the people there, predominantly Muslim, but it didn't make any difference. That's what they did. I'm saying that to say this. The Trabulsis are over there. And they are now going to be ministering over there. Their funds are going to get drained real quick. We're going to give them some money. And uh, we just want to show you this thing so to put it in your mind clearly that if you want to give something additionally today or online or next week, we want to encourage you in that. But there it is. There's the video of what went on over there. It, it was amazing, this explosion that happened. It leveled areas that were there. So many people were impacted. I don't even know the final numbers. But this, this gentleman, Edgar Trabulsi, is a, he's a bulldog. <laughs> So I am certain that he's in the middle of the fray, if he can all be in there, doing things for people. So we want to encourage you in that. We already support them. We want to do something extra special for them right now. Because uh, I don't even know if they're having service on a Sunday today. You know, they might be out there just, you know, what do you do if everything goes wrong? Do you, do you come in here or do you go out there? You know, ministry is sometimes inconvenient. But you know what? It's love in action. That's what it is. So just keep that in mind. So with that, uh, why don't we take up an offering? Can I get a couple of gentlemen to take up an offering? Henry, would you please, and Joe, take up an offering? If you wouldn't, like I said, if you want to do something online additionally or next week, please do that. But truly make it a, 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 a matter of prayer, if you would. Joe, would you please pray? Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your precious word, Lord. What a, what a freedom in your word, Lord. How it lifts up our spirit gives us a sense of service to others. And what a great passage that this king, when he cared about the needy, and he judged rightly for the poor and needy, Lord, you said that he knows your heart. Please help us that we would know your heart, that we would care about the needy and the poor around us, and that we would be giving to them, not keeping to them, recognizing that you give us back far more
All right, praise team is coming up. So hit, this is what we're going to do, folks. It's, it's almost noontime. Aren't you glad I don't speak for hours and hours, huh? I know you are. You, at, least, at least Ruth laughs.